At this point, we're going to turn it over to the hospital budget team. We would like to um, go over um, overall what we're going to be presenting today. This is a recap of the FY20 budget guidance. We, I mean, we will be presenting that. We will also show you the budget requests for the fiscal year 20 budget considerations, the summary of the results that we saw, the net patient revenue and fixed prospective payment, the change in charges, rates, and prices, and this also would include any changes to Medicaid and Medicare and commercial reimbursement. We have key financial indicators, operating margin, bad debt and free care, disproportionate share payments and provider tax, and the 340B revenue because the legislature liked to see that particular slide a lot, and this is included in the other operating revenue. We're showing you ACO participation, and then we'll be showing the timeline of budgets and hearings and the next steps and then final discussion. We will also be showing you system-wide summaries of net patient revenue fixed prospective <coughs> payment increase of 4.5% or $117.8 million over the 19 budget. We're also showing the operating expenses increase of 5.7% <coughs> or $155.5 million over 19. Operating margin budgeted at 2.5% in, an increase over the 19 budget of 2.4%. Proposed $193.2 million in capital expenditures. Those includes the CONs also. Then we have system-wide estimated weighted average of change in charge is 3.2%. We also wanted to show you just a kind of quick look at the income statement system-wide um, and that wanted to make note that 340B is included in the other operating revenue just below net patient care and fixed prospective payment and reserves. Um, a lot of the hospitals are reliant on that extra income when um, the net patient revenue doesn't quite meet their expenses so that they get a positive operating margin. Then we would like to show you what went into the budget guide, and we'll have Agatha show you this one. Thanks, Lori. So we just want to review the budget guidance because it kind of sets the stage for the, the budgets you're about to see. Um, so you released the or established the budget guidance in March 2019. It was sent to all the hospitals. and. The most important pieces for the presentation you're gonna to see today are these three items right here. Um, number one is the 3.5% maximum growth rate target that was set for all the hospitals. Number two, and this was new for this year, is kind of a secondary um, cap that was set for hospitals that are underperforming. So for hospitals whose FY19 um, projection shows a minus 2% or greater variance from budget, they would be limited to 5% growth. And you don't have to do the math in your head because we have slides that have done all the math for you. But those are two kind of limits that have been set um, in the budget guidance. And then the third point is just to kind of um, remind, reemphasize that the budget guidance, although it didn't set forth a, a limit for FY21, it did consider FY21. It considered FY20 and FY21 together um, in terms of um, if, if revenues seem to be in line with the all-payer model target, then the Green Mountain Care Board would, has also established tentatively a 3.5% growth for FY21. So when you're looking at today's um, figures, remember that, that FY21 figure is out there as a two-year target. Um, we did some housekeeping with some board-designated assets. We clarified some terminology. Um, this next slide is pretty much just a summary of what was in the guidance, and there's no need to go through it now, but just to remind you that this is, because um, a lot of work goes into the, the budget guidance this year, and this is what the um, results were from the difference from last year. So once we received all the uh, hospitals' budgets, staff goes through individual hospitals and um, puts 
questions against their budgets, comparisons, or we like to know what, should we ask every hospital the same questions, and then we have individual questions. In this particular round, we asked the hospitals to give us, were their fiscal year 19 projections valid? And if not, give us an update. We ask that every single year. This year, we're asking the ACO, uh, question on ACO reserves and other reform payments. We're also asking the hospitals, because it was in their budget orders, if they are, uh, have connectivity with the VHI through VITAL. Then the next question we ask is, what departments in the projected 19 budget were the expenses exceeding their revenues? Another question was, how can we understand the utilization or census in the hospitals? Give us some kind of statistic that we can start monitoring that type of information. Um, we asked the hospitals, what's the value of one day of day's cash on hand? We're asking some of them for that particular hospital, but also for their parent so that we have something to compare. The um, charge related questions, this one is where we're asking what is your increase in charge, or it used to be called rate. We're also asking to give it by Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial, and what are your assumptions? Then we have additional specific hospital questions, like for instance, um, if they had any changes in FTEs, if they had changes in their balance sheet. So every hospital's questions are unique. Those will be these analyses will be sent to the hospital late today or early tomorrow. And we will have them on the web also. The considerations that we um, taken uh, when we're reviewing these budgets is, or you should consider this report preliminary. We've been talking to the hospitals and found that some of the information in the submissions are incorrect, so we have to inform you of that they will have that in their responses so that we'll have the correct information when you make your decisions um, so usually the board based their um, decisions on NPR and their rate or change in charge but there's other items in each of the hospitals that need to be taken into consideration um, we review we are not done reviewing. We're going to continue to do more analysis after this meeting and so that we'll be uh, having tools for the board for their decisions. And then um, we'll have more analysis at that time. So like I said, this report is definitely preliminary and it helps the board with their decision making. To Lori's point, um, through our conversations with the hospital, we've already identified a couple areas where the hospital submitted something that they didn't mean to submit or um, it was the wrong number or maybe they missed a keystroke. So part of what we think our, we feel our job is is to review the budgets and make sure that what's in adaptive is what the hospital meant to put in adaptive. So that's in, on top of all the analysis we do, we are also trying to make sure that the data is correct. Um, so another, this is another slide on considerations. So as you go through, this is a slide on FY19 amend, amended budget orders. Even though we're talking about FY20, the FY19 budget is the basis for their FY for the FY20 budget. So just a reminder that there were four amended budget orders in FY19, um, two were related to provider transfers, and two were related to a change in charge. So just briefly, a reminder about that. Um, in FY20, we are seeing some provider transfers and acquisitions being requested. Just a reminder that, um, you know, the board and their guidance puts a May 1st deadline on um, requesting an amended budget order. In FY19, for example, the, the, the deadline was May 1st. And so if anything happened to the hospital between May 1st and, and October 1st, we asked them to submit it in their annual submission. So we're seeing some provider transfers and acquisitions and accounting changes that affect both FY19 and FY20. And we have calculations throughout that will help you see what the impact of those were. Um, in addition, there are um, requests for consideration for, this is coming from the UVM Health Network, for unique patients and case mix index. Um, and we have slides on that further on. Is this me? No. Oh, still me. 
Um, this is just kind of a basic summary slide. This format is familiar to you. Um, the only thing that's different in this than what you normally see is the column that shows participation in the all-payer model. We've titled that column Budgeted FPP. This is because contracts for FY9, uh, FY20 have not yet been signed, but we can see in their budgets that these are the hospitals that are budgeting for FPP. Um, on the right-hand column is, there, is the hospital's request for NPR FPP and then a percentage of the total. This slide is showing you the percentage changes between the years of net patient revenue fixed prospective payments and the operating expenses. And we also wanted to let you know about the dollar amounts. So the NPR um, was an increase of 117.8 million over 19. And we found that the largest drivers of that um, were utilization, change in charge, and provider transfers. But that is not limited to what the changes are. But those are the largest ones. The operating expenses, they increased 5.7% or 155.5 million over the fiscal year 19. The largest drivers of operating expenses were inflation, workforce, we heard that a lot on every single hospital, and drugs, which um, some of them get reimbursement in the 340B, that's in the other operating revenue. We also review the capital budgets, and they propose $193.2 million in capital budgets, which are planned and ongoing. So that total 94 CONs was 94.4 million there was gonna be probably 16 CONs. We wanted to show you the system-wide payer revenue for FPP and uh, NPR growth in fiscal year 20. Commercial increase, 6.6% or 92.7 million. Medicaid increase, 0.5% or 1.5 million. Medicare increased 2.6% or 23.2 million, and disproportionate share didn't change too much, it's 1.8% or 0.4 million. We also wanted to show you the chain, the charge assumptions, which is the estimated weight <coughs> average of charges 3.2%. That is taking the rates that the hospital submitted, applying that to the previous year's gross revenue and get a weighted average. Uh, most hospitals assume zero increase for Medicare and Medicaid. So we also wanted to show you in these pie charts what's the poor portions of fixed prospective payments by payer and NPR, the NPR and FPP portion, how much is that FPP, and then of FPP payments, what's the percentage by payer. And then um, on that pie chart, the, there's a little disclaimer, I don't know if anyone can see it, that this is FPP as reported to us as the payments um, does not include reserves. So that would be, if you're looking at an income statement, that would be the, the um, fixed prospective payment line. I do this one too, Laura. Ooh, yeah. excuse me. All right. We wanted you to see the um, operating margins for the system from fiscal year 14 through fiscal year 20, and we are estimating a five-year average of 0.8% or $53.8 million. Um, we, we also wanted to show you by the type of hospitals, so prospective payment hospitals and critical access hospitals. We also noticed that fiscal year 18 was where both types of hospitals had quite a dip in their operating margins. Yeah, and after that dip, there is an increase, but that's um, the FY19 budget, just so you know that this is actuals all the way up until you get to FY19, and that turns to a budget year. So the next couple slides are gonna have lots of numbers on them. Um, this is where we're getting into our system-wide looks. We're moving away from from sort of high-level observations, and you'll start to see information on a hospital level. So here we are, NPR FPP as a dollar value. The next slide will show it to you as a percentage change. Um, quickly go through the columns. Um, FY18, act, how they actually ended the year. Their budget 
as of FY19, so this includes those amended budget orders that we saw, those four amended budget orders, their projection for the rest of the year, and then their budget for FY20. And then this next slide shows those same numbers, but as a percentage change with the column in bold is really the column um, that's the heart of the discussion is the budget to budget percentage change from last year to this year. And that's where you see the 4.5% as a system total. So this slide has a lot going on and we're gonna spend a couple minutes here. Um, and we kind of consider this slide to be a reference slide, um, a tool that a board member of the board could use during the um, budget season. So it's the NPR uh, percentage growth by hospital, and I'll just go through from left to right. This first column here, budget to projection variance, this is important to consider because it's hitting on um, one of those criteria in the budget guidance. This is for the hospitals that underperformed in FY19 and whether or not they would be subject to the 5% five, the 5 cap. So the um, figures in red in this column is any hospital that dipped below the minus 2.0 but also exceeded that 5% gap. So you'll see that there's a uh, 5% limit. You'll see that there's hospitals in that row that definitely went below the minus 2%, but they're not in red because they satisfied the 5% limit. Any questions about that? Excellent, all right, the next column. Uh, now we're, this, this line divides the variances with percentage growth. So um, this line is as submitted in adaptive, the percentage growth from last year to this year by hospital. So any hospital whose figure is in red is a hospital that exceeded the 3.5% cap and also that minus, uh, I'm sorry, the 5% limit for the underperforming hospitals. So those are all the red numbers in that column. And then the last column is um, their percentage change from year to year. When you factor in provider transfers and acquisitions and accounting adjustments. So th these are the things that happened between May 1st and now that the hospital is bringing to our attention as um, a transaction or a transfer or an accounting change that affected their budget. And a breakdown of this column by, to be specific, is down below. These are the hospitals that are requesting provider transfers, accounting adjustments, and then specifically accounting adjustments related to um, ACO accounting. And specifically for ACO accounting, it's bad debt collection fees move to expenses, so they're coming out of revenue, and payment reform investments moved into deductions. <coughs> um, one other thing that's worth noting here is that Northwestern Medical Center, um, they had a dermatology practice leave their practice in FY19, and although we're not talking about hospitals specifically, you need this information in order to interpret the chart. Um, so that happened at the beginning of FY19. Um, if that had been considered for their budget to projection variance, they would go from having um, a red number here. Am I looking at the right house? No. Um, it would go from a minus 2.1% to a minus 1.4%. I'm sorry, from where I'm sitting, I thought I was pointing at Porter, but um, so they would go from a minus 2.1% variance to a minus 1.4 variance. So they would not trigger the cap if you factor in the loss of their dermatology practice. Did I make that clear or did I make it less clear? There's a footnote that makes it clear. <laughs> All right. Next slide. Um, so this slide is specifically about the UVM Health Network. Um, so in addition to requesting consideration for provider transfers and accounting adjustments, the network has also requested consideration for changes in um, what they refer to as unique patients and case mix index, a change in their case mix index. Um, the network attributes these changes to a population that is sicker and older across the network. So the dollar value and the percentage impact on their NPR is in the chart below. Um, but we don't plan on getting into detail about that today. But are there any questions about this chart and how to interpret it? So my question is, was there substantial supporting documentation that it's different than other hospitals? I mean, all of New England is older demographics and things like that. It's just curious. No, and we didn't ask for it. We are kind of um, 
we do analysis on the income, all the financial documents, but we learn a lot in the hospital um, presentations. So we're expecting that UVM, because this is where the budget guidance says, unless justified. So this is where the health network would have to come in their budget presentation and justify. Yeah, I think when you read their commentary, that's what they're trying to do is explain their overall growth at 6.6% .6 for the network and then calling out these two pieces as contributors and then what's left. So I think they're trying to use it to just explain why they're exceeding the cap. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay, more numbers. Um, this is a breakdown of, again, this is a reference. The, no one has to understand this just by looking at it right away. This is just a reference for um, you start to ask yourself, well, what exactly did the provider transfer do to the budget? And sometimes, for example, in Northwestern's case, it's a minus because they lost a practice and a positive, and it's netting out to a positive number. Um, so this is just a list of everything that came in. We would like to point out that our um, analysis is not complete. We're following up with the hospitals to make sure that they fulfill the requirements set forth to notify patients when a uh, practice is um, acquired. We need a little more clarification, at least on a couple practices, whether or not the projections we were given were a partial year impact or a full year impact. And we need more clarification on whether or not these acquisitions were independently independent providers in the community that were acquired by the hospital, or whether they were their expand, um, or whether they were expansions of the hospital's existing services. Um, so, still more work to do on this. This chart is showing the uh, preliminary look of the change in charges. We used to call it the price or rate increases. But this year for 2020, we specifically gave the hospitals the definition of what we were looking for, and we wanted to know what is your change in charges. But we also wanted to point out that there was on the UVM network's narrative the effective rate of commercial. So that's why you're also seeing that on the far right. This is where you will be making decisions on reducing their change in charge that, and how much is that gonna affect their net patient revenue. This chart is showing you just uh, that same uh, information on a system look of how the board or the past hospital budget commissions um, affected the rates submitted versus approved through the last decade or more, two, last two decades. And we wanted to show you the history of the NPR and FPP from fiscal year 14 through the current budget and all the, the changes in between so that you have some history of the growth then that, this one is the percentage change between those particular years. Can I just add to that? <coughs> and then, Agatha. Just real quickly, um, you'll notice that at the bottom of FY18, it says 2.9, and there's an asterisk. This is to call out the fact that the, the year-end report that we produced in March at that time that, that reported the results of FY18, um, North Country's data was still preliminary. And at that time, the system total was a 3.1% growth. Since North Country has resubmitted, and it brings it from 3.1 down to 2.9. So we wanted to call that attention because this could potentially be the first time that we're updating that number in a public setting. And this is the operating margin in dollars from fiscal year 17 to the budget 18. And we wanted to try and give you a five-year average for each hospital and then the system total. The next slide is we were, as we mentioned, this is preliminary. We found out that the five-year average for the operating margin percent is incorrect. So we need to correct to make an adjustment on that and repost this slide on the web. But this is the operating margin percentage for each hospital.
So this next slide is a summary of um, utilization and staffing levels. Um, we collect information uh, about utilization on, on many levels, but the one that we bring to, the, to this report is adjusted admissions. So um, we have the adjusted admissions listed with the total. We also um, report on staffing levels for, for non-MD FTEs, for MD physician FTEs and travelers and the system totals are at the bottom. Um, on the, on the right-hand side of this chart are the percentage change from last year to this year um, by hospital and as a system as well. So an interesting note on travelers is that a lot of hospitals budget for zero travelers and then project that they will have travelers. So you'll notice that there's a lot of zeros there um, for the budget, and you'll notice that there's a lot of zeros over here for the change, but in between is a projection that has travelers in there. So we would encourage um, um, board members to look at the, in each staff analysis, there's a, a, a page for utilization and staff, and that's where you can see more detail. Um, because we do hear a lot about the use of travelers, but we don't see it in the budgets. Um, and we have questions for hospitals about that. Uh, the other thing we wanted to mention is, like we keep on saying, this is preliminary and we already know some of these numbers have to change. Yeah, hospitals detected some um, issues. So just kind of generally, we report on adjusted admissions. It shows an increase of 3% over FY19. Um, Staffing levels are increasing 360 positions, which is 2.4% 2, 2 above last year. Um, and I will, we will say that looking at 360 um, um, may or may not sound like a lot, but a lot of those positions have already been staffed in FY19. So they're building these off of their projection. Um, if you break down that 350, or I'm sorry, 360, it's 351 non-physician FTEs, 14.6 um, physician FTEs and a drop in travelers. Um, but as Lori stated, we know of at least one hospital that needs to revise their um, staffing numbers. All right, so um, we are including these sorts of charts in our standard reporting to the board. These are um, a handful of key financial indica indicators that you're familiar with shown from last year's budget, the projection, and this year's budget. Um, so we won't, we'll not go over these in detail, except to note that we're still following up with Southwestern. They have a parent company, and we are um, we're asking them about their day's cash on a hand with, when you include their parent company. Um, operating margin and total margin. And then days payable, days receivable, and debt service coverage ratio. Every year we're also asked to show charts on bad debt and how much it's increasing or decreasing per hospital. And we wanted to um, bring la that to light. Last year I had combined bad debt and free care, but we'll separate it in this presentation. Again, it's preliminary because these hospitals will probably be changing their numbers. We, we never know, so. Do you want to mention the high deductible health plan? And be, yeah, because of bad debt and free care, um, it's your high deductible health plans. Bad debt is where people have insurance but they can't pay or, or refuse to pay, excuse me. And some of it is the high deductible health plans. And um, the, all the hospitals seem to have like some kind of collection agent to um, try and collect some of the bad debt. The free care is where people can't pay for their care. And so this is also where um, I believe some of the dish payments are also supposed to help some of the hospitals on some of this. So then there's the dish payments and what's happening year to year. This particular slide does not show when it was for the system total over $37 million. Now it's down to $22 million for fiscal year 20. And Grace Cottage does not receive a dish payment. Provider taxes, and I believe this is correct, is it 6% of their net patient revenue and fixed perspective payment that they pay to the state. And what we do when we receive these dish payment and provider tax calculations from the budgets. We also compare that to what DIVA has given us 
just to see if we should be notifying the board that we should make adjustments or not. Oh, and so for, Lori gave me this one because I love the 340B program. I'm fascinated by it. So, um, um, because it comes up over and over in the hospital budgets narratives that they are increasingly relying on other operating revenue as a way to produce positive operating margins. So this shows um, history of the short history of the program and you can see from these numbers how much it grew even from last year. We include this slide, even if we don't include it in our preliminary presentations, the legislators always want to see this information. The other thing is the reason why Copley and Springfield are at zero is because they don't qualify. Right, and the reason Porter um, shows zero in FY18 is because they were previously recording that in a, a different, in non-operating revenue. So, um, okay, moving on. We wanted to show you the ACO participation, and this is based on the fixed perspective payments alone, not necessarily reserve. And so you can see the changes from year to year for each hospital. So as expected, it's growing into year, the fiscal year 20. The contracts have not been signed yet for fiscal year 20. They're still trying to gather data from OneCare. And then this, these maps may look familiar. This was um, Marissa, one of our colleagues back at the office, put this together that shows participation in all payer model from performance year zero up to performance year two. Um, and you can see how the participation is growing from year to year. So that concludes the, the data portion of the presentation. This next part is, is procedural. So um, <laughs> we should probably pause and see if there are any questions. Questions? Tom? Um, I do. Um, go back and find So if we go to 5.15. Oh, yes. Fifteen, you said? No. Okay. Okay. And I'm just looking at the um, Medicaid increase one half of one percent, and uh, what I understand is that that is what hospitals have submitted to us. Um, do we have any triangulation on that number from Viva um, in terms of, of what they would say um, the growth might be in, in Medicare managers? No, not to com compare to this particular process. Because, uh, you know, I, it's just a number that is always striking to me that 22% of Vermonters are insured by Medicaid. And then and as last year in the budget process, um, such a small amount is dedicated toward that population, which um, means that the cost shift goes up. And, yeah, that's that's a, a relationship I think that we need to be very explicit about so that policymakers can understand uh, either change it or understand at least what they're doing um, just so that it's not hidden. Um, so do those Medicaid numbers include the dish payment reductions? In 2017, the amount of dish was, I think, $35 million. And then it was reduced to 22, and I, I may re not uh, 22 million. I may be remembering wrong, but I thought there was going to be a continuous pattern of reductions um, in this, or is this a leveling off around the 22 million dollar number? This is all based on what the um, hospitals are budgeting. If you looked at the number for DISH, if we could go to slide uh, where DISH is. Mm -hmm. 33, thank you. Does anybody need slide 15 anymore? <laughs> no, because we'll make everyone see sick. In our calculations, usually the DISH payment, um, we try to have it pulled out so you can get a um, just a look of the regular payer, and then we pull out dish. So, presentations we include it, so it depends on the presentation. But in there, it would not be included. 
But when you're talking about the dish being uh, reduced, that would be on this slide. And like I mentioned, it was the previous years, it was at 37 million and now it's down to 22 million based on what the hospitals budgeted. And we take that, like I mentioned, the budgeted amount compared to what Diva said. And it's a, it is a little different for each hospital. But most of the hospitals got the most current data from May. But Tom, if your question was, um, did, does the Medicaid increase of 0.5% and or 1.5 million include DISH? It does not. That's that's reported as a separate line item. So actually, what that means is that the uh, one half of one percent could even be less if you're going to net out the DISH thing. The di any dip reductions, if there are any. Right. Um, if there's reductions. So is it, is it worthwhile just checking in with Diva um, on? Uh, Um, we we can do that, but we also want would like you to know that we give them through the year the year to date um, actual like fiscal year 19 information to Diva so they can keep their projections up to date. When we get actual data coming in, like this fiscal year 18, we give that to Diva. They're also going to want to see these budgets, so they're they're going to constantly update their data. But for us to go back and compare, we don't usually. Okay, um, now let me turn to page. It was on page, um, start on page 16. Um, so on page 16, you have a, a margin at the top uh, that starts in fiscal year 14 and goes up and I'm just looking at the actuals now so if this money is, is, is done it's fixed um, and so if you add the numbers from fiscal year 14 to fiscal year 18 the total amount of that margin is 300 and over 393 million dollars across all 14 hospitals and then if you go to um, page 26, and uh, we don't go back to 2014 here, but I've done it. And if you add up the uh, UVM Medical Center's total margin for that period, it comes to 316 million. You and I have looked at this order, so we know that's the number. And so that's 80.4% of all the margin over that five year period. And then here on page 26, you can see that the projected margin total is 42 million, 42.5 million, and uh, the UVM Medical Center share of that is 39.4 million dollars, which is 92% of all the uh, margin projected for 2019. And I'm just wondering if. Uh, you know, that's something we should take a special look at as to what might be driving that um, because it is out of sync with the medical center's 49 percent share of NPR that in terms of what's filtering through their system uh, is uh, is is uh, significantly higher than that and I don't know if that's a driven by case mix or you know what might be driving it but I think it's a it's because we're talking tens of millions of dollars here. It's something to understand as to whether or not um, it's something we should be concerned about or not. Um, we did ask the question for the hospitals to give us their operating margin total, operating margin and total margin, their assumptions in their budget. So it, sh it could be addressed in their narratives. So like we can, I don't know if you saw that or not, but we can but that would only be for the current years. Notice as I look at these graphs now over the past year, you see one huge positive and then a whole bunch of negatives for the remaining among 
to the main mm -hmm. hospital. Right. So if you look at the bottom line on a gross basis, say, oh, there's $390 million worth of operating margin. Great, that's a big number. But it's the distribution of that across all 14 hospitals that's an issue. And as we see, you know, um, chart after chart, there's a lot of mass hospitals that are, are um, in the red in terms of their operating margins. Okay. Right, that is something that we're observing and, and tracking is um, budget, budgets have, at least in the recent history, history, have all been, for the hospitals, positive operating margins. They budget positively. Most of them end positively. Um, but in, which slide is this, the next slide? You can see in the, in the next slide um, how hospitals are ending. There's a lot more in the, in the negative than there used to be. And this year in FY20, two hospitals actually are starting off the year, they're budgeting with a negative operating margin. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, I have a few questions. Um, if you can go to page um, 18. And really, this is really just some observations. So when we look, first of all, great job. It's very incredible. The whole you guys have together. It really helps us in all the upcoming presentations. Um, when we look at the second column in the budget to projection change for 19, um, you know, it's important to note that 10 of the hospitals are missing their numbers this year. Um, overall, we're getting to about the same place because um, UVM is up 1.9 percent, and the rest of you know, the bulk of everyone else is down. But you know it, that goes then in context with the requests in the next column on the budget to budget, where six of those hospitals that are down are asking for increases significantly above the guidance. So that would be something obviously we're tracking because they're missing, you know, some of these hospitals have repeatedly missed forecasts and really just want to be focusing on making sure we're not looking at some what I call aspirational budgeting because if we're budgeting too high, the expense load gets budgeted at that rate. And if in fact the top line doesn't come in um, just on the normal course of business, not because of any changes that the board imposes, um, it's very hard to correct that. And that's where you know when we go to um, page seven, that operating margin page you were just looking at before, uh, it really highlights um, how many hospitals that have moved in the projection to negative. And I appreciate what you were talking about, Tom, but I also would look more at the overall rates and um, being 2.7% for UVM. I mean, you know, what is the right rate to be at? We want it to be positive, obviously. So, I mean, I don't look at a 2.7 operating margin as high, necessarily. Um, the problem is all of the hospitals that are negative many of which didn't budget to be negative, obviously, and so it's missing that top line. And, you know, we've seen repeatedly where hospitals will come back in, assuming they're going to get back to the number that they were at before or compared to their budget, and then when they miss, they um, are losing money. And, you know, so that, that's a big area of concern. And so I would just kind of point out that, you know, 10 of the hospitals are missing, and yet overall for the system, we're looking at a 4.5% request when the guidance was 3.5%. Um, so something to, to look at there. Um, when we go to the page 19, I think there, the column to the right will be showing what the actual requests are. And, you know, I look at these adjustments that we put through here as bringing things really on an apples to apples basis. So if somebody made an accounting change, it's, it wasn't in one year and they put it in the other year. 
if they um, had a position transfer, you know, that makes an adjustment. So, you know, there we're looking at, you know, overall 4.7 with one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, half of the hospitals exceeding the guidance. Um, some of them pretty significantly. So obviously those will be things, you know, we're looking at. And I think if you flip to the next, next page, you know, on the commentaries by the human network, they've brought up two different factors that it looks like they'd like the board to consider that they're meeting the numbers if you exclude these factors. And um, just a couple comments on, you know, this is the first time we're really seeing this, and, and that could have been something that maybe got presented to the board earlier, because what we don't know is, I think many of the hospitals have case mix index issues where the population is sicker, and therefore um, it's costing more to take care of them, and none of the other hospitals have you know, given kind of case mix index. So what I do, the way I do look at it, though, is I'd say, you know, UVM overall, the network came in at 6.6, um, and that's the number they're requesting is a 6.6. Within that, these two things do contribute to that, and so we'll have to look at, you know, how that impacts. The difficult part is we're not seeing that offset elsewhere. If all the unique patients are contributing 3 point, you know, we, we've got about $50 million of adjustments to the numbers, but we're not seeing that offset elsewhere. So it'll just be things we'll have to you know, look at when we're going through the presentations. Um, and, um, and one other on page 25, you know, just to ground a little in the history, in the past several years, 16 was, you know, for the outlier was 4.4, 17 was 2.8, 18 was 2.9 system-wide, 19 looks like it's going to be about 3.8, and then, you know, again, going to 4.5. And, you know, one of the concerns, the reason we have the 3.5% guidance was to be looking at the healthcare model and try to work at that two years. So, you know, how do we, how do we look at that? Um, you know, in, in that context. Um, and then the other page, you know, just to comment on from the UVM network piece, I would look at it a little more um, that in the 2019 forecast for UVM, it was it was low. Their original request, I think, was at 1.6. Now they're coming in at 3.5. And then next year is 4.1. Not to say we would accept that, but I, I look at it a little differently. Like the, the 19 budget, the request is much lower than what the guidance had been. Um, I think that's it. I think overall, there's a lot of good information. Maybe moving into the budget hearings and you know, dig in a lot deeper. Um, there certainly are a lot of hospitals still struggling. And you know, one of the variables we did see, because if you go to the commercial increase, um, some of them are very high on the commercial requests. And some of the hospitals spoke to the way they got to that number was just getting to 3.5% and then plugging the difference. And we really want to make sure we're looking at all opportunities for cost savings and things to offset. Um, some of the pretty significant commercial asks that go through the system. But more to come, right? We'll get into all the meetings. But thanks for all the information and the hard work, you know, putting it together. The one thing we also heard from some of the hospitals when you mentioned cost savings is the cost savings affect their Medicare cost report settlement. So the less cost, the less of a settlement, because they're not going to necessarily get the um, charge increase that they're requesting. Instead, they have to get it through their costs from Medicare. But we heard that quite a few hospitals this last week. I guess the challenge on that would be if, in fact, um, they're accurately getting everything they should be for Medicaid and Medicare, because these are the hospitals that are losing money. Right. And so making sure in their cost reports they're getting everything in there that they can. I know they're trying to. I'm not saying that. It's just when you're losing you know, 5 or 6% and 
whether it's plus one or minus one that you get reimbursed if we're if, if you have an operating margin less than that and there's concerns with that right other questions or comments from the board okay at this point i'll open it up to public comments or questions Kevin, did you want us to finish with the procedural part in case there's a public comment on the process from here on out? It would make sense. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the timeline, right now we're in the July-August time period where um, we do s staff analysis and um, we also forward uh, budget materials from the healthcare advocate. Um, we examine um, all of the hospital's narratives, all the supporting documents they sent to us. Um, we also do statistical analysis and um, review their budget submissions against the compliance, or we'll say the budget guidance, and then we will re have our analysis ready. We've also talked to the hospitals last week and this week. We'll have our analysis ready the, late this afternoon, tomorrow, final, and then we're asking the um, hospitals to respond by August 9th. Also on this timeline is what we're talking about today is this preliminary presentation. And then um, we will be asking the hospitals to send their presentations into Abigail or to us by August 14th. So all of them are in at the same time before hearings. And then these are the dates for the hearings, August 19th, 21st, and 23rd, and then the 26th and 28th. We will let everybody know I'm the bad guy that is going to make sure that everybody adheres to that time period. Okay. I know that somebody's already requested a change, but it won't be granted. Um, then we go into deliberation August 29th, right after the budget hearings through August 14th. August 14th, um, and well, actually, the 14th and 13th is when we have to have a final decision. And then we formally start writing the budget orders between that time and September 30th. So uh, what we plan to do as staff is to, as Lori said, finalize our questions and send them out today um, and continue to um, analyze, listen to the hospital budget hearings themselves, and then we'll prepare some recommendations. Um, we're also going to look at uh, the submissions as the, to make sure they're in compliance with the budget orders from last year. So we'll just make sure that everything's kind of, we're following up from the things we asked them to do last year. Um, from the board's perspective, um, what you'll be doing the next few weeks is to review and evaluate indi individual hospitals independently, um, go to the hearings, review the co public comments that come in from the public, um, any comments that are coming from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, and as Lori stated, approving the budgets by September 13th. So <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I've got a question from Maureen. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, that you said that the, uh, that the overall budgets don't show any new volume to UVM. Did you say that? No. Oh, you didn't say that? No. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. The volume that exceeds the caps that they were given. Well, I understand that, but the, 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 the question here is whether you're getting redistribution of the patient load across the state from one hospital to another. Okay, and if the if that if that is true, then that's one thing. You've suggested that on the front end by saying that at least I forget your number of this many as ten of these budgets were aspirational. No, that's it. Okay. Ten of the hospitals were 2019. I'm missing the top line projection right now. On the flip side, the total request for all of the budgets is four and a half percent, which exceeds the three and a half percent. So it doesn't seem like it's showing that swing for patients from one area to another. But, you know, we have to analyze that. That's what I said. Ten projection to projection, 19, 10 budgets are missing, and it's starting to be. 
um, and those are the hospitals. I think if you look at their operating margins, their operating margins are negative. And so the caution is to really test. And you can see on some of the hospitals, they're down this year quite a asking for a 12% increase next year. And, um, if that doesn't happen, they feel they're expensive to get that problem. And since many of them are fixed, they can't adjust quickly during the year, and then they lose money. So, you know, a lot of the you know focus that I've done in the past hasn't just been on the hospitals that exceed the cap, but those that are underperforming and you know losing money. We don't want to have situations where hospitals continue to lose money and can't you know break covenants and, and can't sustain that. And I'll also say that we went through a rebasing discussion not that long ago. It's not something that I think the board is receptive to doing every single year. Other questions or comments? Sure, Bob. Um, thanks. I just I'm curious. On slide 14 is a reference to the 16 CLS ongoing for almost 100 million dollars. How does that impact the budget consideration process by the board? So I was quickly changing pages, but I thought I heard you ask how the CO ends. Yeah, it's, it's on slide 14 at the bottom. Yep, the capital budgets, yep. Jump on that, sure. The CONs are planned. They are not in the operating budgets unless they've been approved. And like if we mention an ongoing CON, that means that it had already been approved previously, so that would be in the budget. But if it's like um, UVM's EPIC or their Miller building, that's already in the operating uh, um, budgets. But if it's something that they're, like an MRI that a hospital is planning to have, that would be one of the CONs. And it's just a mention that they plan to do it. So if it gets approved during the course of the year? We will be amending the budget. Okay. Assuming that the CON doesn't have a condition that it not impact the budget, which a lot of them do. Right. The vast majority of them do. Well, it would have, it could have depreciation impacts, but a lot, a lot of time that's lagged till later. Correct. And it's going to have cash flow impacts. So, you know, usually when the hospitals are looking at their budgets, they're assuming in their cash flow that there will be capital expense, and they'll make some assumptions for depreciation, but the actual approvals would be there. It typically is not supposed to increase commercial rates to offset CONs to make the numbers stable. Oh, the okay. Last, okay. The last note is um, this year we had a definition of what change in charge was. Previous years we called it increase in rates or prices. And basically now we want to know what are you changing your charges to Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers? And what is your overall increase in your change in charges? So this, this information was on the budget guidance, and we also had the hospitals fill out an appendix. Okay, I'm just wondering though, what did I actually get with the fixed payment perspective? That would have... Um, so Gail, each of these are different terminology changes. So the first is that it clarified that net patient revenue is the addition of the fee-for-service revenue and the fixed prospective payment. So that's one terminology change. A second terminology change was the rate increase the change in charge. That's unrelated to the NPR FPP. Is that okay. help? Okay. Maybe to clarify one more. So, you know, the hospitals will say they, they charge the same rate to everybody. So if the, if the charge is $100 and they take a 5% increase, it goes to 105 but the actual, then the, the change in deductions and actually what passes through would be 5% for commercial but zero for Medicaid or zero and zero for Medicare. So we want to make sure we're understanding by payer type what the actual change in the charges versus the rate that may have affected the gross cost at the top. Thank you for the presentation. I want to uh, end the uh, team, even though you've been down in uh, 
Thank you. The staff analysis will be on the web also this week, later this week. And um, there's also a lot of other summary documents that um, people can access on our web. Like we have what is called the trends report that takes all the different statistics and rates it by hospitals. Um, that's a really good report. It'll take some of these measures and you can rate them like UVM and where, how they measure up against the rest of the hospitals, who's number one, who's number 14, and things like that. Thank you. 